hemodynamics. Where's that scene from? What's that film? The most underrated comedy in the world. If you've never watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail, please. And do it with a beer. It's the, it's the greatest movie in the world. And that, I love Mark Twain too. Get your facts first, then you can distort them as you please. Okay, and this is, this, this is an example of how medicine distorted, either intentionally or unintentionally, resulting in huge harm. All right, so here's the basic question that as a house staff officer, I worried about, and unfortunately, uh, many, many years later for you guys, I think it's almost as difficult, if not more difficult as it was that many years ago. You need to know, your patient is told, and please, the one other thing that will get Dr. J's VWP, which is my vein wedge pressure elevated to a nine, is to call me and tell me the patient has soft blood pressure. There is no such thing, my doctors and my medic friends, as soft. We are taught to be precise and use words. Words mean something. Don't tell me the patient is soft. They are hypertensive. And watch me go cross-eyed when we're doing a trauma case together. And some anesthesiologist said, oh, his pressure's soft. All right. What you want to know, though, is this formula. This is the basics of everything we do as surgeons in the ICU, especially for shock, okay? Shock is inadequate option delivery. What is option delivery? Flow and content, all right? Flow is the pump. Content's the hemoglobin. And at 2 a.m., it's that simple. The first thing I do at 2 a.m. is, is my pump working as well as it can? And I usually, I'm blessed because a lot of them are young, strong pumps. And all I gotta do is fill the pump. So we're gonna talk about how do we fill that pump to get preload established. So let's go into the history. So heart rate times stroke volume times hemoglobin times SAT, that is all you need to know. And so we can, we can, we can troubleshoot. We can't do much about the heart rate. We can certainly do a lot about the stroke volume. And at a later date, we can talk about oxygen content and hemoglobin. Okay. I bet you you didn't know this unless you and I have talked about it, but the Frank Starling curve is not written by Francis Starling. It was written by these two guys. And that's Otto J. Frank. And he wrote the paper in Austria, actually did the first work in 1876. The dude knew this in 1876. He took out a frog heart, a live, you know, a ex vivo, explanted the frog heart, filled it with a little eyedropper, used DC voltonic cur uh, current, and then hit a little chymograph. The paper was lost until Ernest J. Starling, an American physiologist, came along and uh, worked from 1910 through about 1922 on a, a beautifully elaborate, if you want to see a really nice experimental protocol, read his papers. He used an anesthetized dog using manometers to hold pressure steady, and he confirmed the, the Otto J. Frank's observation. That's the Frank Starling curve. Remember now, here's what's really important. The Frank Starling curve says end diastolic volume, capital V O L U M E, volume sets stroke volume. And stroke volume is what I want to optimize if I want to optimize flow. Okay. The other thing is that relationship is not linear. There's an optimum and it's an exponential curve, it is not pressure. All right. So, how do you measure end diastolic volume? Is it CVP? Is it wedge pressure like we are told? Is it the right ventricular combo cath, which we just used last week, or is it ultrasound? Let's go talk about that a little bit. Okay, I was taught in medical school that CVP is of some utility in, in figuring out this end diastolic volume relationship. Where'd that myth come from? Okay. These are the various things we're gonna talk about. This is the one and the only paper I could find after digging into the literature that ever suggested that CVP was of any utility in figuring out how well the heart worked. It's from a group of cardiothoracic surgeons in 1959. You can see they used 25 post-op patients, no testing, no statistics, no summary data. And they had this really complicated algorithm of volume loading and CVP. And if it did this, you might wanna do that. That's the only paper, if you search CVP and cardiac performance, the only paper I ever came up with. And I don't know how we've been teaching it. We still, you guys were still taught it, I bet. Either formally in your first two years or at the bedside that you use CVP to has something to do with cardiac performance. Nothing to do with cardiac performance. What's the one thing that CVP will reliably uh, measure or predict? Mean airway pressure. If you wanna know what your ventilator's doing, you want to know what the pressure is inside your chest of a ventilated patient? Check their CVP. It's almost a one-to-one -one transduction. 
get your facts first, then you can distort them any way you want. Okay. People have come back to this time and time again, and it's kind of like voices crying out in the desert. So this was a paper uh, published about six years ago. CVP is unable to predict fluid responsiveness among a broad range of patients. The assumptions are incorrect. And this is how we, we've been cascading. This is why we still don't understand hemodynamics at the bedside. Okay, what about a PA catheter? Interesting, this is some of the stuff when you read history is just fascinating. So I did not know this until I read a little bit, but a physician, Dr. Forsman, the guy who invented cardiac catheterization, the first patient he cath was himself through, through his brachial vein. Uh, and then uh, he, it was picked up by some of his uh, junior partners and it was refined and really cardiac catheterization starts to come into currency in the late 50s. And the three of them, Forsman, Kennard, and Richards, that were actually given the Nobel Prize for their work in cardiac catheterization. So cardiac cath in the 60s was commonplace. Uh, and in the late 60s, when Swan, there's when Swan and Gann emerged, and Swan and Gann's were, in fact, cardiologists. They practiced at Cedar sinai and they were routinely cardiac cathing patients. Okay? So true story, um, because they both, Swan and Gann's just recently passed away. Uh, in uh, the late 90s, I actually heard a lecture given by Swan. But Swan's innovation actually was, as a cardiologist, he had cathed the patient. And his first paper was, his innovation was simply after I finished cathing the patient in the fluoroscopy lab, cardiac cath lab, I just took the patient back to the ICU and I left the catheter in place. And I taught the nurses in the ICU how to take care of the catheter. And I measured pressures for 72 hours before I pulled the catheter out. That was what led them. And then his junior partner, Dr. Gann said, well, if we put a balloon on this catheter under fluoroscopy, we can, you could demonstrate that it'd be flow directed. And that was Gann's contribution. And then they sold the proprietary information to the Edwards Corporation, Edwards Cardiac Corporation, and that became the Swan Gans catheter. Then we got into trouble. So in the late 70s, they start marketing this. And, you know, I lived through an era where Swan Gans was not a noun, it was a verb. And on morning report, yeah, I ended up, you know, I had to swan Mr. Jones last night because he crashed. So we swanned him and, and you know, are following his, his, uh, his cardiac performance. Um, they emerged and they became the most commonly utilized ICU procedure without any data whatsoever behind them. In fact, you would think that somebody would have, the first randomized controlled trial is somebody would have said, using swan ganses, can we predict cardiac performance? Or does a wedge pressure predict cardiac performance or stroke volume or anything? None of those papers were ever done. It just was sold. Why? Because they sold us on a bill of goods. All right. So. They were brought into widespread use without evidence, initial technology and technique. None of you have ever actually probably even had to look at swan waveforms at the bedside. But first of all, it was flawed assumption. Second of all, trying to read a wedge pressure in a patient who was mechanically ventilated on elevated airway pressures and catching their end expiratory wedge pressure was demonstrated. The one paper they did write is that only 50% of clinicians could actually measure wedge pressure accurately. So we couldn't even measure wedge pressure accurately, okay? Um, so the, the, the biggest thing is this was all based on a myth, okay? Now, let's go through that myth. So the catheter came out and it said that, you know, cardiac cath or cardiologists were wedging since they started catheterizing patients under fluoroscopy. If you've not watched somebody get cath, you take the catheter, run it through the RV, out the PA track, and you advance it until you see what? The catheter will stop and it'll buckle when it hits the end pulmonary capillary and it wedges itself, that's called wedge. Now, if you have a catheter in that position and it's wedged into a pulmonary capillary bed and it's looking downstream, is it accurately transducing left atrial pressure? Yes, why? Because you have to make the assumption that there's no resistance drop between where you're measuring and the left atrium. Is that true across the pulmonary capillary bed? Yes, it is, why? because the cross-sectional area, there's such a huge capillary bed across your lungs that the functional effect of resistance across that infinitely large capillary bed is zero. So yes, it does measure left atrial pressure. Does left atrial pressure equal left ventricular pressure? Yes, if you don't have mitral valve stenosis. But does left ventricular end diastolic pressure equal what Otto J. Frank and Ernst J. Starling told us to worry about, which is left ventricular and diastolic volume. Does volume equal pressure in the ventricle? 
right? You remember this part? It's the compliance of the ventricle. Remember what you were taught about the ventricle. Remember what Swan and Gans said is EDV and EDP are linearly related. That's why if I knew one, I could predict the other. That's bullshit. That's wrong. You know, on the right-hand side, all right, that as you fill the ventricle during diastole, you can fill volume up and pressure stays isobaric, right? It's only at the end of diastole that pressure goes up and it goes up exponentially, not linearly. So there's nothing in the world that would predict or say you can predict. That's why you can take and look at end diastolic volume and depending upon where the patient's contractility curve is and where they are on that curve, you could have three different uh, volumes or three different pressures. There's nothing linear about this relationship at all. And Swan and Gans as cardiologists should have known better than anybody else not to sell us that, okay? But they did and everybody just, they accepted the emperor's clothes. And that's why when you actually go look at it, the emperor was found not to have any clothes on. So central venous pressure, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure are no, I, I will never advocate those in the middle of the night to you guys, all right? What they will reflect and what a wedge pressure will reflect, what a CVP pressure will reflect, if, especially if your patient's on a ventilator, is what the ventilator is doing has nothing to do with heart. And in fact, this is where it would be really perverse because if you think about it and a wedge pressure is measuring pressure, I'm down in the SICU and I got a patient on 12 or 15 a peep and the medicinos come on down because it was their patient I operated on who's now in distress and has ARDS. And they come down and they, they would wedge the swan and they'd see a wedge pressure of 15 and they go, oh my God, that's high. And so they'd push late, they'd try to push Lasix on my freshly operated on patient who's still hypovolemic because they saw a high wedge pressure reflecting mean airway pressure. And the heart was dry because all that pressure kept the heart from filling. So then we drive them into renal failure. And that's why it was just such a friggin' mess that I'm glad we got rid of wedge pressures. But the baby got thrown out with the bathwater because even in the 90s, this catheter, which we have here today, has been available. And this is a second generation pulmonary artery catheter made by the Edwards Corporation that measures and calculates end diastolic volume. It goes back to what Frank and Starling told us, measure the volume. This catheter actually available, and we put one in last week, is they're up on the third floor and you can put them in, it floats just like a regular swan. Let me show you how this works. And here, this time before it got marketed or right after it got marketed, here's data from a surgical ICU at Detroit receiving done in the nineties by Larry Diebel and Frank Wilson that says, if you at two o'clock in the morning wanna know if you wanna volume load the patient, this catheter will tell you with a great, with a receiver operating curve of greater than 90% whether your patient's gonna to respond to volume or not. And here's the data that suggests that. Because if you look at wedge pressures, which we were taught are your predictors of who responds to volume and who not, wedge pressure was absolutely unreliable. As many people in the high wedge pressure as the low wedge pressure responded to volume. But if you looked at end diastolic volume, and I'll show you how this gets calculated, this is a low volume, this is a middle volume, this is a high volume. You can see that based 64% of people who are low volume did better with fluid. People in the mid volume range, about one out of four. Most importantly, if your end diastolic volume was high, don't give them fluids, give them pressors, give them an inotrope, but I know they're not gonna respond to volume load. And that's the catheter we still have today. And it predicts 100% of who will not respond to volume. Okay, how does it work? It's kind of interesting, but what it does, it does continuous cardiac output. That's not new, that's been around for 35 years. It has a thermal element wrapped around the catheter at 30 centimeters, it sits in the right atrium. It heats the catheter, sending a warm fluid bolus downstream. It measures that bolus and essentially shoots its own cardiac output. It does it over a period of four, six minutes and until it sees the algorithm fitting very nice and tight. So it really, it's got a really nice data assurance, but until the data stabilizes out, it won't show you a cardiac output, okay? So if it knows cardiac output, you take a monitor cable from the back of your vital science monitor and you put it into the back of the box and it tells the box what the heart rate is. So if I know cardiac output from continuous monitoring and I know heart rate, I then know stroke volume, okay? Now, the next thing it does is kind of interesting. If you think about it, this, this part, 
wake up. All right. Um, from the top of the cardiac output curve, you turn the heat off and the signal washes out. The faster that signal washes out means the more or the more briskly or the more vigorously the heart is ejecting. Does that make sense? The quicker you wash the signal out, the more vigorous your ejection fraction. So by watching the washout phase of the cardiac output thermodilution curve, the catheter can actually calculate ejection fraction. So now with a calculated ejection fraction, and I know the stroke volume, I can solve for end diastolic volume. So the catheter continuously shows you end diastolic volume. And in fact, in the new monitor, you can set up the screen so you can have Frank Starling's curve right in front of you with the patient over time. It'll show you what their end diastolic volume is and what the subsequent stroke volume that it's calculated. And you can load the you can volume load the patient and see if they go up or they go down or go to the left or go to the right. And you can tell exactly where on Frank Starling curve your patient is. The other thing that I regret is that when the swan GANs got thrown out the window, okay, the other thing you forget is that when we put in a swan GANs, the other thing we could do that was useful is we could measure mixed venous oxygen saturation. And if you want to know if your patient's in shock, the singular most important number in my estimation is what your mixed venous oxygen saturation is, right? Because think about it. See, we don't even talk about this on rounds anymore. Okay, we talked, we used to talk, I, favorite question is patients in shock, what's their extraction ratio? The more a patient is shocked, the less adequate their oxygen delivery is. What is their tissue going to do when it sees blood? It's going to grab every last gram of oxygen it can get. Therefore, your mixed venous comes back lower and lower and lower. So the simplest thing we used to do is just monitor their mixed venous. And we got their, you know, what is your, what is, what is my mixed venous right now? It's 85%. You put a patient in shock in the ICU and you see a mixed venous of 60, you got work to do and you just resuscitate them. So all of the, all of the oxygenation parameters are gone. And don't forget this combo cat, the other thing that's nice about it, in addition to giving you end diastolic volume, it has a continuous oximeter sitting in the PA catheter at the tip. So you get continuous mixed venous. So in this guy, this was the trauma patient who had blunt cardiac arrest in the ICU and cardiac dysfunction. We put in the catheter, he had elevated end diastolic volumes because his right heart was stunned and his mixed venous was down to 62%. And I knew I had a flawed pump and I wasn't going to be able to push the pump a whole lot more. So what's the first thing we did? Flow times content. I can't fix flow a whole lot. So what do I do? Fix content, boxcars. And you could sit there and as soon as the blood start, you could watch the mixed venous continuously being read. Went 62, 64, 66, 68, 70. In real time. You get all that from putting in a PA catheter, all right? Um, real quickly, because I'm running out of time. Yeah, no one. Yeah, because but you need the mixed venous, right? You see me do this, most of you, in the ICU, this is the, when you bring me a sick, if I'm doing nights ICU and you just operate on a gunshot wound and you lost 15 units of blood, I'm gonna, first thing I'm gonna do is set up the A-line to do this. Okay, you see me stack the A-line because we're gonna talk about pulse pressure variability and uh, cardiac reserve monitoring, compensatory reserve monitoring. And one of the reasons we're gonna do that, well, you know, let me get, where, oh, I, uh, it's the other lecture where I have Dr. I have Dr. Convertino. Understand there's two things about this. So each of those, when you stack an A-line, each A-line signal that you expand it is what? It's representing the stroke volume, right? If you do the differential and you calculate the area of the curve with a single arterial wave pump, that is stroke volume. If the patient is mechanically ventilated and you're exerting positive pressure, especially on a hypovolemic patient, what's going to happen to venous return every time you ventilate a fire? Two heartbeats later, after that diminished right ventricular ejection fraction gets over to the left, it results in lower preload on the left, the left's going to eject less of a preload, the arterial waveform is going to dampen, right? So what you're looking for, see the top? How much stroke volume variability is on that top trace? That much, look at the bottom, okay? What's that patient on the bottom? Patient's volume deficient. I will tell you today, 2021, 20, Probably this is the most reliable, quick, down and dirty indicator that you can use in Bagram, you can use in BAMSI, you can use, and it works on a pulse oximetry signal as well. Any kind of pulse oximetry. 
cell pulse oximeters that actually will give you pulse volume variability. Okay. The Massimo RAD7 will actually give you that same number. But look at that's the patient. And you can see if you counted out that sinusoidal variation, that corresponded exactly to the ventilator. Okay. Every time the vent's firing, it's rather preload. That to me is one of the most reliable ways. All right, it's eight o'clock. I'd love to talk more. I would just tell you, please, for God's sake, my favorite thing to do, especially on nights, is come by. If you don't understand how to read vent waveforms, I'd love it. I'll teach you that. If you don't know how to do that, I'll talk your ear off in the middle of the night with that one. But uh, I want to let you go so you can get to the rest of your academics. Alex, thanks for inviting me, and uh, I'll come back anytime you want.